Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. My name is Marcus Grodi, your host for this program, and it's always a great pleasure to be with you when I have this privilege of introducing to you men and women who, because of their great love for Jesus Christ, were drawn home to the Catholic Church. Our guest tonight, Colleen Hammond, came home, uh, she's what we call a revert, I guess. In other words, she was brought up in the faith, and, but then went way out there, and then by God's grace, she finds her way home. And she's here to talk about um, not only that journey, but how much of a struggle that journey can be when God gifts you with many, many gifts, many, many opportunities, good opportunities, but that cause you to make difficult choices. And of course, Colleen and her journey was seeking eventually, not always, but eventually to do what God wanted her to do. And so we'll talk about that in a minute. Now you're always an essential part of this program, so write these phone numbers down. 1-800-221-9460, or you can, if you're outside North America, you can call at 205-271-2980, or you can send me an email at journeyhome at ewtn.com. Colleen, welcome to the Journey Home. It's Thank great you, to have you here. You've never been on television before, is that right? Oh, maybe once or twice. <laughs> <laughs> well, the audience will find out in a bit that you actually have quite a bit of television background. That's part of that struggle, finding out what it is God called you to do, because he gave you lots of opportunities. But I'm going to get out of the way and ask you if you could begin by giving us your spiritual background. Well, as many people who probably watch EWTN, um, I was cradle Catholic and born and raised in the faith. I was born in 1962, so it was kind of a volatile time during the time of the church. And I think my parents were probably one of the original Roman Catholics because they were kind of roaming around. <laughs> you know, because some of the churches yeah. you, that we were involved with kind of took the yeah. spirit of Vatican II a little bit they over They were already the edge. changing real fast, and faster than even the, than the council was encouraging them to, just kind of running with it. Right. Truly. Some people, I think, took the liturgical changes much too early and started in the 50s and early 60s. So we ended up going to a church that was uh, pretty far from our house. And I'm the youngest of four. All my brothers and sisters uh, attended Catholic schools. Uh, but because we were so far from the church that we were attending, uh, I didn't attend a Catholic school. And uh, grew up, um, you know, driving, gas for mass, we used to say. You know, got a lot of gas in that car, which, you know, as many people can relate to now, because I know there are still people that are driving quite a distance to attend a mass. Yeah. Uh, so when I was a, probably around 10, 11, 12 years old, I saw a little book that was just outside the vestibule of the church. And I looked at it. My mom said, no, go ahead. That's okay. You can pick it up. It's from the Blue Army. It's a good story. You should read it. It was a story about Our Lady of Fatima. And I was so intrigued to think that heaven would send our Blessed Mother, or anybody for that matter, to speak. And all she asked was that we pray the rosary. And I was so convicted that I could help other people and help all of the world and all of creation by just praying a rosary at night. So, and, and to this day, you know, I still keep my rosary with me, but I started to pray the rosary in bed at night, just by myself, it was my own idea, and would lay there and pray myself to sleep. And as I got older, you know, it's a habit that I continued to do as well. But when I got about 14 years old, it was time to be confirmed, and we had to go in and sit down. My brother and I went in and sat down with the priest, because of course he did not want to have us confirmed without knowing for sure that <laughs> we had some idea of what we were about to do and what awesome responsibility it is to become a soldier of Christ. And so we went in and sat down, and the very first question the priest asked was, what can you tell me about the Passover? And I seriously thought he meant the freeway overpass. <laughs> I mean, that's how well I knew my faith. I really didn't know my faith at all. And I listened to my, the question being answered by my brother, I thought, oh, I vaguely remember that. Yeah, that's right. So I don't know if I never paid attention during catechism class or if they had us too busy washing rocks and making collages or what exactly we were doing, but <laughs> I was clueless. Years, yeah. Yes. So I was just kind of clueless. So my brother answered all the questions. I thought, wow, this is pretty neat stuff. I'd never heard most of it before. So the, I think the priest just thought I was a little shy. So you came in on his, on his shirt tails. I huh? definitely came in on the shirt tails. So we ended up being confirmed, and I picked St. Anna as my patron saint, and, and 
went through high school. Uh, it was my senior in high school. I started getting involved in some pageants. Around about 15, I started doing some modeling uh, because I am quite tall, <laughs> as you know. <laughs> I'm six foot one. Uh, so I started doing a lot of modeling and, and started earning some money toward college. And my agent said, you know, if you want a pageant, then that really you know, boosts your resume and you can get more jobs and earn more money. Hmm, I thought, okay, I think I can do this. <laughs> so I went into a, and got into a pageant, and first time, you know, you're supposed to kind of test the waters, see how they run, how they're operated, and, and I won. I thought, oh no, now what do I do? And I was so shocked when they called my name that I couldn't believe it. Uh, so I won that, and then I started doing more commercials, and she was right. Boy, I filled mm. out my resume, and all of a sudden I started getting all these jobs. I went away to college. Well, because I didn't know my faith, I quit going to church. I didn't see the importance. I didn't see the relevance. Uh, my mom used to call on Sunday afternoons and I would talk to my parents and she would very casually ask, so uh, how was the sermon this morning? And I would lie and say, oh, well, you know, it's kind of boring or I'd, I'd make something up. And I think she started figuring it out. Most moms are very smart that way. And so then she would say, well, do you remember what the gospel reading was? And if my mom had not done that, I, I don't know where I would be today, really, that she cared enough. And I hear some parents say, hey, they're, they're 18, they're on their own, I did the best. My mother cared enough to continue, because she was more concerned about my soul, and that she continued to ask and to, I know, pray for me, and to be gently encouraging me to come home. Uh, I dated a few different gentlemen, and whatever church they were attending, I attended. And uh, I went to the Baptist church, and I did Methodist, uh, Presbyterian. Uh, I'm not even sure what some of the places were. Uh, but I always felt, deep in my soul, still something was missing. I still felt that sense of longing, that somewhere just something wasn't quite right. Uh, so even though I, I was just kind of dabbling here and there uh, with uh, different faiths and different religions. You uh, praying the rosary as a young girl. When did that stop? Actually, that never did stop. I uh, continued to pray the rosary even all those years during college. Yeah, I wondered about that. Isn't that interesting? And I, I think it was kind of... For me, it was more that mantra. Yeah. I, I don't think I wasn't reflecting on the different mysteries of the rosary. I wasn't thinking about God. I really wasn't thinking about much. It was just a habit that I had developed from the age of 10, 11, 12 years old. Yeah. So I continued just to pray that rosary. But the reason I mention that is that our Holy Father and others have taught about the mystery of the rosary. And though I know when I was a, a Protestant, I would never have understood and I would have belittled it. But I know now, once we understand the, the blessings that come from that discipline, that it's like in that scripture text that talks about the Spirit prays for us and groans too long to be heard. So even when we don't know how to pray, the Spirit prays for us. And, and I, I look back on, now, now I know where you are, that, the, you know, where you went through, yet there was this thread of hope that was still there from that early wonderful tradition you were taught by your mother that was at least there kind of holding you all the way through that, well, you know, only by God's grace came together later. Um, but you're, you're um, so you're drifting around. You're not just a Roman Catholic. You're a Roman Christian or Roman whatever. You yeah, know? <laughs> he was just a, a Roman date. You know, right. Right. <laughs> just whoever I was dating at the time, if they happened to be going to church, it was almost like instead of considering it a spiritual experience, it was almost like going on a date with my boyfriend. <laughs> so, I, so I always just went wherever they were. Your career took off. Career skyrocketed, started doing uh, a lot of work when I was in college. I did uh, auto shows, fashion shows, mm -hmm. um, some commercial work. I got a chance to do some a little bit of soap opera work. and. Even then, it was very interesting because even though I did kind of ignore my catechism growing up, and even though I wasn't attending church at all, there were times that they would put out outfits for me to wear, mm -hmm. and I would try to exchange them with one of the other models because I thought, oh, I just can't wear that. 
um, or I was auditioning for this one commercial and I read through the script and I saw different things in the commercial I thought I don't want to do that mm. and I don't think it was as much that I was just too much of a prude that I would ever consider doing that or wearing that because based on the kind of outfits I was wearing at the time I don't think anybody would probably <laughs> consider me a prude um, but I think it was just deep down inside the character imprinted on our soul or natural law of God pulling trying to pull me toward him and and to keep me on the right path and and so even though I didn't have that spiritual conviction that I shouldn't wear this or I shouldn't do that. I, I, I just knew something was wrong and I just didn't want to do it. Let's uh, take you on ahead to, even though you had that sense of conscience in that area, it didn't stop you from keeping the going in a direction, not career-wise, but getting yourself into hot water pretty soon, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, things got uh, a little bit dicey here and there, um, but I did have an opportunity to take a role that would have really mm. blasted my career. Mm. And because of the different scenes and things that were involved, uh, much to my agent's chagrin, I turned it <laughs> down. And I do talks around the country to different high school groups and pro-life groups yeah. and, and conferences. And it really saddens me when I have people come up to me, young people, high schoolers or even college students that come up to me and say, you know what, if it would have launched my career, I would have done it. Uh, no. And I think how far we have come in our morality as a society and as a world where people are so willing to give up something so sacred or intimate or so important just to grab the brass ring. And that's what culture was telling me. That's what society was saying. Go for the brass ring. Do what it takes to get the, the money the success, the fame, the car, to be doing all the things that society said. And it wasn't until later that I found out that everything they, the world had said was a lie. And the things that I had come up with on my own was not true. And it wasn't until later that I, I started looking at what the Catholic Church was saying and thought, wow, they're right. This is truth. And I guess I'm wrong. I guess society is wrong. And I guess this faith that has been here for thousands of years and then 2,000 years for the Christian faith and the Catholic faith, wow, I guess it's right. There's truth involved. Your future hus husband enters the picture soon? Yes, I started dating my husband. Uh, I think it was my junior year in college. Uh, and he was actually already out of college. Mm -hmm. And he comes from a family that uh, I guess they were not they were not Christians, they were not religious. Uh, his father was an athlete and his mother worked at the school. Uh, but religion really wasn't part of their life. Uh, now my mother-in-law has said that, you know, she really tried, she really made sure. I felt like she was apologizing to me, which I didn't think she really had to do, but um, that he did not grow up in any faith. Uh, uh, his only faith, I guess, would have been sports. Yeah. Hmm. Which, you know, considering the popularity of ESPN, ESPN2, ESPN3, ESPN4, ESPN5, you know, <laughs> I, I think it's a cultural thing as well. It's like the Greeks where they see so much importance in, yeah. in um, conquering and muscle and power. And so we, we dated for a while and he popped the question and I said yes. And, and it was about that time that I actually uh, got into television hmm. and we were engaged. And my husband said, well, do you want to keep your maiden name or do you want to take the married name. I said, well, I think I should take my married name and go with Colleen Hammond. And he said, you know, I think your maiden name works mm -hmm. nicer and it allow us to keep a little bit more privacy. Why don't you just keep your maiden name for television and then that will be your television name and then, um, you know, the married name. So we got married and all the television station that I was working at where I did the weather had all the television cameras there and they were all there to cover the wedding and uh, it was just a wonderful time. And, but religion was never part of our life. And from people from the outside looking in, here was this very successful television star, for lack of a better word. And my husband was um, academic All-American. He played basketball. He had a basketball scholarship. He had a chance to go pro, which I didn't find out until a couple of years ago. He actually turned that, he actually turned that contract down. And I never found out until a couple of years ago. Um, but from the outside, you know, I look back on it now and I, I like to an, an, uh, use the analogy of a sprinkled donut. 
it was, here's this donut that has the frosting on it with all the little sprinkles, and it's so pretty to look at, but there's a hole right in the middle. And we didn't realize it at the time, but that hole in our life was the absence of God. And it's like St. Augustine said, you know, our hearts are restless until they rest in you, O oh Lord. And we didn't see it, um, but something was always missing. But here I was, successful. My husband was a successful businessman, and we weren't happy. Yeah. We were miserable. We were drinking, we were partying, we had lots of money, we did, you know, we went on trips, we did things together, but there was nothing there. It was so yeah. hollow. Yeah. But I was doing everything society said I should. I was pursuing the career. I'd attained the career. I had the success. I had been a Miss Michigan teenager. I had been a television star. I had done the movies. I had done the commercials. But it was so empty. Well, then in the midst of that came the potential third, right? Yes. We were miserable, and then I got pregnant. Now, you see, in television, pregnancy is a good thing because they always say it's good for ratings. So pregnant women are good for ratings. As a matter of fact, before I was married, my news director actually recommended I get pregnant because we were <laughs> going into sweeps. Yes. So uh, I got pregnant and I thought, I don't, I don't need this right now. I have a career. I have a very sex successful career. I was actually negotiating, or my agent was negotiating to take Willard Scott's place, mm. for me to take Willard Scott's place on the NBC Today show. Al Roker, I guess, got my job. <laughs> um, so uh, things were going really well, and as society always told me, I don't want to mess it up by having a baby. Mm. So I thought, oh great, now what do I do? Well, there's just nothing, no question about it. I'm going to get an abortion. Why don't you go ahead and tell what happened there? Well, I... Because that was really one of the main steps that opened your heart to come back to the church, wasn't it? That was yeah. the major step that opened yeah. uh, me coming back to the church. I discussed it briefly with my husband because uh, quite frankly, I was just being polite because I didn't think he, it was his decision. This was my decision. This was my body. I had bought into all the feminist lies, whether it was about career, uh, being a mother, uh, being a wife. Um, you know, I, I look now and I think, uh, think about all the times that driving the car, we'd go anyplace. I drove the car. <laughs> you know, and then my husband said, you know, I get car sick. You know, oh, okay, you can drive. So I thought, gosh, how much more, instead of the husband being the head of the family, you know, I was the, either the head or sh I was sure going to be the neck that was turning the head. And I had bought into all these lies, so I've never even discussed having an abortion with him, except for the fact that he needed to take me. And I went to the, uh, one of the clinics and found out I was pregnant. Then I went to another clinic, and they said I was pregnant. Then I went to a third clinic, and I said, you know what, I think you better do a blood test. I want to be sure because my background is chemistry and psychology. That was my undergraduate studies in college. And I thought, I want to be sure, so you need to do a blood test. And did a blood test. Now, anybody who's had pregnancy tests before knows a blood test is 99.9% .9 accurate. You know, they take and the hormones. And all three of those said you were pregnant? All three said I was pregnant. <clears throat> so I arranged with my husband. I said, we need to go, you know, Saturday morning. They told me to be there at 9 o'clock. And that's a frightening thing for me too now that I look back and I see how these are arranged. There was no counseling, there was no advice, there was no informed consent. Uh, it was just, honey, you're pregnant, be here Saturday morning at nine. So I, and make sure you bring somebody to drive you home. So sure enough, I showed up Saturday morning, nine o'clock, and went marching right into the abortion clinic. It sat my husband down and I said, this will be four hours. And I went right smack dab in there, and the first thing they do is they give you a little paper cup with a Valium in it to calm you down. That's the very first thing when you walk in the door, every single girl gets a Valium. Yeah. And they put it in the little cup, and they give it to you, and they tell you to take it, and you down the little Valium, and then they march you, all of us, into a big room and sat us down in a circle. Hmm. Why don't you go ahead and... The uh, reason I asked that, you were three times they said you were, because I want the audience to hear how that... It actually came out right. pretty amazing, <laughs> but also then how that helped you into the church. Right. Well, it ended up that we did go into the huge room, mm -hmm. and we were all sitting in this big circle. And as coincidence would have it, mm -hmm. or as I like to say, God incidence, mm -hmm. um, because when we go through those things at the time, we just are kind of clueless, we're just kind of walking through. Um, but then when you look back, you know, they always say hindsight's twenty twenty. But looking back on this specific instance, but many instances in my life, 
I can see the direct hand of God that was guiding those incidences and that there is no such thing as a coincidence. Everything is in just instructed and, and handled by God in certain ways. Not that he interferes with our free will, but that he's always there. So I sat down in this huge circle, furthest person from the door, and they started to explain the procedure and how the tissue would be removed. And not to worry, they would take care of everything and, and they, were, they were there to take care of us. Um, and I knew another group was coming in after lunch. You know, they had the nine o'clock group, they had the one o'clock group. And I just told my husband I'd be gone for a couple of hours. And as she started to explain how the tissue would be removed, I started to get very physically ill. Mm. And I thought, I can't do this. Now, the pro-life movement back then was nowhere near what it is today. Mm. And it wasn't like I had been informed that I had read brochures or that somebody was at the sidewalk. You know, if somebody had been on, at the sidewalk, I'd have been one of the ones that had been rescued. Mm -hmm. Because even going in, my cocky attitude, my confidence, mm -hmm. deep down inside, I knew it was wrong and I really didn't want to do it. Mm -hmm. But there was nobody there to give me an out. I was told I was pregnant, I showed up at, show up at the clinic, we'll take care of you, and I did what I was told and such emotional times that young women are in and they're torn and they're not sure. They're waiting really, I think, for someone, at least I know I was, somebody please tell me what to do. Give me an option. And so I was sitting there getting physically ill and finally I just put my head down almost, almost all the way to my knees and the girl to my right leaned over to me and said, are you okay? I said, no, I'm not. I can't do this. I can't do this. I gotta get out of here. She said, me too. Hmm. I thought, oh good. <laughs> <laughs> and then the girl to my left, so we were kind of chatting, whispering back and forth, well, what are we gonna do? I don't know, what do you wanna do? You know, how are we gonna get out of there? Because we were the furthest from the door. So the girl to my left leaned over and said, what are you two talking about? And I said, well, we're gonna get out of here. She said, me too, I'm coming with you. <laughs> so we linked arms and we stood up. Actually, just before that, we linked arms and then we just kind of sat there for a second. And I thought, okay, I've got the support, now what do we do? And for the first time in probably 10 years, I said my first genuine prayer, please, Lord Jesus, get me out of this. And I suddenly had this surge, and I stood up and dragged those two girls with me. And at that moment, the door opened on the other side of the room, and a young woman stepped in and said, is there a Colleen in here? And I said, that's me. She said, honey, you're not pregnant. <laughs> and the girl to my left sat down. And the girl to my right and I walked out of the room. And I look back now and I think, knowing what I know now and the strength that I have now, I'd have grabbed every other one of those girls in that room and said, come on, you guys, we're getting out of here. But we got out into the hallway and the gal that left with me I, she just gave me the biggest hug. And she said, I am so happy for you that you're not pregnant. <coughs> what do you say to that, <laughs> right? So I thought, oh dear, um, I'm sorry you are? And she said, oh no, 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 no. And I pulled back and she had the biggest smile on her face. And she looked at me with such love and tenderness. And she said, I'm so happy. I'm gonna keep this baby. I'm gonna be fine. Mm, praise God. And she walked out. I don't know who she was, or if I'll ever see her again, unless in heaven. Maybe, maybe she's watching tonight. If you're watching, <laughs> call me. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I walked out, and my husband was very shocked to see me. And I said, uh, let's go. And he said, uh, okay. He said, are you done already? And I said, no, I'm not pregnant. Find me the closest Catholic church. Mm. And another God incident <laughs> just so happened to be a Catholic church two blocks away from the Planned Parenthood clinic. I think they plunk them down next to churches and <laughs> defiance or something, I'm not quite sure. Um, but I went into the church and I told my husband, I'll be back in a couple of minutes. Now I just told him I'd be back in four hours and I came back in half an hour. Now I told him I'll be back in a couple of minutes and I came back a couple hours later because I, I wanted to go to confession. Mm -hmm. I wanted to come home. And I walked into the church and there 
just so happened to be a priest there hearing confessions. And there just so happened to be nobody in line. And I walked in. Now, I don't know what happened in the 10 years that I was out of the church, but I was looking forward to the box with the screen and the curtain and the, you know. <laughs> and it said reconciliation room. And, you know, I'm thinking Russia and the United States meet in the reconciliation room. But, you know, I walked in and it was a chair and the table and the mints. And I thought, this is not what I wanted at all. <laughs> you know? But there was a priest there and he looked up and he said, yes. And I totally collapsed at his feet in such pain and humiliation. And I said, Father, I'm so sorry to do this to you. This is going to be the, one of the worst days of your life. I haven't been to confession in 10 years. And I threw myself at his feet and he reached down and he grabbed my hands and I, I just held my, I held on to his hands and I buried my forehead into my, I think he probably still has my nail prints <laughs> in the palms of his hands, but I went through 10 years of every commandment that I demolished. They, it was like, I must have thought they were suggestions of what to do instead of what not to do. And I got to the end and I said, Father, and I kept my head down because I was so embarrassed. I said, Father, after he had absolved me, I said, thank you. And again, I am so sorry to have done this to you. I know this has got to be the worst day of your life. And I looked up at him, Marcus, and he had the biggest smile on his face, and tears were rolling down his face. And he said, are you kidding? This is one of the best days of my life. Welcome home. I know you mentioned uh, earlier that uh, you weren't even sure this was the real priest, right? I Maybe he was an angel. <laughs> I think he might have been an angel. I have never seen it. We went to that church after that, and I never saw him again. Yeah, that's great, because God does do that kind of thing. So yeah. We're going to take a break now, come back in a moment. But the first, before your question, as we get back, I'm going to ask uh, Colleen to talk about now how her return to the church affected her life in four specific ways, what it meant in her terms of her career, her, her role as a mother, her role as a wife, and her role as a woman, and we'll be back in just a moment to hear about that. Welcome back. Our guest tonight is Colleen Hammond, and she did an excellent job condensing so much. You know, there's still so much. It's always hard to, to try and too bad we don't have a two-hour program and get all the details in. But before we go to phone calls and emails, uh, it, there's so much more I'd like you to talk about in terms of your actual conversion back to the faith and the details you went through. But why don't we look at it in these four areas, which are important to conversion anyway. How did your reconversion to your faith in Christ in the church affect your calling and your career because you had become very successful in that also then as a wife how did it affect your marriage mother understanding of being a mother and then finally as a woman uh, your understanding of your womanhood okay, well you have to help me keep those I in will. order because okay. okay. <laughs> um, I think I'm gonna start with them out of order actually okay. so um, I think the first the career really wasn't if, uh, as affected uh, right away yeah. Um, because I thought, well, I can still pray and, you know, do these things. I was going to daily mass, so actually it worked out with my career um, because at the time I was doing the weather, the weather channel and some other things. And so I would be able to go to mass in the morning and then I could go from mass to work. And then I worked normally in the evenings. Um, so the career wasn't as affected as much. The marriage, big change, right smack off the dab. Because remember, when my husband and I got married, I wasn't involved in any type of faith and he wasn't involved in any type of faith so we never went on our date to his church because he wasn't attending church so that was a big difference my husband never intended to marry a nun 
And suddenly I'm going to Mass every day. Um, instead of just praying the rosary to fall asleep at night, I'm, I'm praying the rosary and meaning it and praying for my husband's conversion uh, to Christ, first of all, if, if just that, to bring him to a uh, knowledge and understanding of our Lord Jesus Christ, and then hopefully to get him into the Catholic Church. He'd sleep in Sundays, I'd go to Mass. So there was a big change there. I was starting to understand a little bit more, and I, I don't think it's because I read Ephesians 5 and said, you know, wives be subject to their husbands. And it was an understanding where I really wanted my husband to be the head of the family. So there was a change with that. I think as I grew in grace, I started to understand naturally that I wanted my husband to be the head of the family. So the marriage changed tremendously, um, and not necessarily for the good. There were some really rough years. Um, but then it, it was when the mom and the career kind of changed at the same time. Mm. I became pregnant, and what I really wanted was for somebody to take, I would take my six weeks, and then I was going back to work. And it, it didn't quite work out that way. Um, after a very long and painful pregnancy, I, I, they say nine months, I swear it's a lot longer than that. Um, I gave birth to my precious firstborn son, um, and they put his 11 and a half pound body in my arms, and I looked at this toddler, <laughs> it was pretty big, and I thought, no one is touching this child. And even my husband leaned over my shoulder to kind of look at the baby, and I was very protective. <laughs> Something, and they don't tell you this, but there is a hormone that's released when you give birth that completely changes everything. And that it's called the mothering hormone, and it basically turns a woman into a mother lioness who will do anything to protect, she will kill to protect her cub. And I had never experienced this feeling before. Um, so then we made arrangements for me to leave television. So that's what really changed my career. It was motherhood and career that changed at the same time. Um, and it was growing my, in my faith that I realized the responsibility. My mother had sacrificed career and her life to raise us four children. And she stayed home, even though times were rough. And I started to recognize that, that this too is, is what I wanted to do, was to stay home and to raise my family. So um, that changed. And it was around that time as well that I read a study that um, I was bored, I had one child, I used to walk to the library and read studies and, and you know, do things. You know, that first child, there's not much to do except for bounce them on your knee and teach them their colors and things. Um, and I read a study that a marketing and advertising agency had done about uh, men and how they reacted to women wearing pants. And it was done in the 60s and 70s, late 60s, early 70s, and when pants were really first starting to come out. And it said that when a man looks at a woman from behind, when she's wearing pants, his eyes drop to her bottom. And when she's turned and facing him, a man, man's eyes also drop to the same intimate area. And I was so disgusted. I said, oh my, I can't, oh, I, I got rid of all my pants. Well, of course, we were a one single income family. So there wasn't a lot I could do. I ended, and I'm, because I am so tall, I ended up you know, sewing my own dress, which wasn't all that modest, but at least it wasn't <laughs> pants. But I started to grow on my understanding, too, of what it meant to really be woman and what it, man was. And there really are differences, not just in our, our, our uh, chemical makeup and our body, bodily makeup, but in our soul and our character. Mm -hmm. And a man is called to do one thing where a woman is called to nurture. And those are the gifts we're given. And, you know, like we talked about earlier, we're given many gifts, and to whom much is given, much is expected. Yeah. And we talked about the, the talents of um, the man who was, you know, the, what you're given, what do you do with it? Yeah. And I, I started to understand and learn that femininity is not just um, our bodies, it's our calling, it's our mm -hmm. vocation from God to use the gifts of intuition and of nurturing that we're given. And that's one of the things that led to this book you wrote, right? Dressing with Dignity? Yes. Dressing with Dignity. I think yeah. maybe the audience will see a picture of that. But we have a caller on the line that I think would like to make a comment about this book. Hello, uh, Dr. Alice von Hildebrand. Hello. Are you there? Yes, of course I'm there. Hello. Good to talk to you. Good evening to you and good evening to Pauline. You, you spoke about providential meetings. And uh, I truly believe that our meeting in California was providential. You know, when uh, you shared my little book, The Privilege of Being a Woman, 
and you have such a deep understanding now for the greatness and the mystery of a woman's mission. And, you know, I particularly uh, I was grateful about your stressing of the virtue of reverence, which my husband calls the mother of all virtues. Now, I'm on a topic which I'm very tempted to talk for a couple of hours, but I'll try to limit myself just to two remarks. You know, there is a word in the gospel which is so profoundly meaningful. Seek you first the kingdom of God, and the rest will be added unto you. Now, when I read your little book very carefully, you find out that when someone truly dresses with dignity and has a feeling for the mystery of the female body, you know, this is something that actually enhances her beauty. You know, I sometimes marvel at the fact that people whose body is not a Venus or an Apollo insist upon dressing in such a fashion that actually they do not realize how anesthetic it is and how uncharitable for the people who have to look at them. There's another thing that I want to tell you in which I believe you should develop further, and this is what I call holy cosmetics. We live in a society where people are so concerned about their appearance, but they totally forget that there is something called holy cosmetics, and that every act of love or charity or an attitude of purity or kindness Jesus, the feast that we're going to have in eternity. I'm not responsible for the feast that I have now, but I'm definitely responsible for the feast I'm going to have in heaven. So thank you for the work that you're doing. Continue. Thank you, Dr. Von Hildebram. You'd like to? What an honor. Thank you for appreciate. calling. Thank you for calling. And it was your book and, and our meeting three years ago uh, in California that um, I read your book in one night. You were so gracious to give it to me. And I went back and took The Privilege of Being a Woman. I took that back to my hotel room. And you know how you read books with a highlighter pen. I was highlighting almost everything in the book. And um, we were privileged to spend three days together. And I went back and talked to Dr. Von Hildebrand. And she's the one that told me to write this book. Mm -hmm. And she said, you need to do this. And uh, it took me two and a half, three years, but uh, I researched it and did get around to it. And well, I know on the, web, on the television screen that they'll at least picture there how they can find it. I'm wondering, in case someone's listening on the radio, what website or something I should say? It would be at uh, ColleenHammond.com. There we go. Okay, so very C O L L E E N H A M M O N D.com. There you go. If you're interested in the book, I was thinking about this issue of, of uh, dignity. Uh, uh, modesty. It reminds me that the things that God has given to us, the material things in this world, uh, are often amoral. The, the things in themselves, nuclear energy is amoral, but it's what you do with it. And I was thinking in areas of modesty, that's what a mirror is. It's amoral, but it's what you do with it. Good point. You know, you could use a mirror to worship yourself, to love your, you know, overly get caught up in yourself, or a mirror can be a way of helping you see through the eyes of others what you are, how you're dressing and how you're looking in terms of then how you're proclaiming Christ to the world. The mirror can help you see that mm -hmm. in a way you can't without the mirror. So it's a gift if used correctly, right? Correct. Absolutely. Uh, let's go with, um, oh, also I want to say that dressing with dignity is also available on the EWTN Religious Catalog. I want to make sure I, I encourage you to go right to the EWTN site and you can find out uh, more information about that. All right, let's go with this first email. This comes from Rushad in Florida. Dear Mrs. Hammond, I must say that was a most profound conversion story. My heart goes out to you. God bless you. Are your parents and siblings better Catholics since your reversion? And how about your husband? Pax Christie, thanks Rushad. Wow. Um, that's a loaded question. <laughs> Actually, my husband did come into the faith, and my husband is a phenomenal head of the family, spiritually as m well as morally. And so he did eventually come into the faith, yes. Um, my, one of my sisters um, has recently come back to the Catholic Church, and uh, you know, my, my other sister and my other brother aren't going to like this, but I'm still praying for their reversion to the faith as well. So if you can join me in my prayers, that would be great. All right, thank you. Let's take our next caller from Mary Vallow in, oh, is that the one or which one are we going to? Um, okay, we'll go to this one. This is from MB, dear Marcus and Colleen. You mentioned in past broadcasts that members of the Catholic faith, whether priest, nun, or member, were not well formed. 
What is your definition of a well-formed Catholic? <laughs> Thank you, MB, for that very <laughs> challenging question. You, do I really have to take this? <laughs> what is my we'll definition of a We'll start it on your of side of the table first. Yeah, okay, good. Like we'll a, go like that a tennis ball. I, I'm a mom, so uh, my definition of, you know, it, it's interesting. I'll go back to my mom again. Uh, when I came back into the faith, um, my, or actually it was when my husband was coming into the faith, he attended an RCIA class. And it was in December, and the, the man who was teaching the class said, okay, December 8th is coming up in, in the Catholic Church, that is a holy day of obligation. And my husband said, what is December 8th? I mean, why do we have to go to church? He said, well, it's the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. Now, my husband's a very bright man. Uh, he was academic All-American, valedictorian of his class, and he said, well, what is the Feast of the Immaculate Conception? And the man who was teaching the class thought for a minute. He said, um, it's when Jesus was conceived. Well, Catholics know that Jesus was conceived March 25th, and he was born December 25th, nine months. And like I said, my husband's a smart man. He went, let me see, December 8th, December 25th, that's like, what, 17 days? Ten instead of nine <laughs> months? And the teacher said, well, that's what made it so immaculate. <laughs> so I told my parents about it, and my mom sent me a little Baltimore catechism. Now, we see the catechism of the Catholic Church now, right? It's this big, huge thing. That was way too much for me. I needed meat and potatoes. So I actually started with the Baltimore Catechism, and it's what founded, gave me that foundation in my faith, and actually it's what I still use. Yeah. I often use the phrase, not well formed or formed, because really pointing to the fact that our consciences, we hear people today talk about li act in your conscience. Mm. You're free to act in your conscience. Well, the importance is a formed conscience. We aren't free to, our conscience isn't free to just do whatever is good or bad, we're called to have a formed conscience so that we're free to do what is good. And that's what our training in CCD, in the family, in our local parish is to do. And the church has given us a wide variety of things, Ten Commandments, learning the, the Lord's Prayer, the variety of prayers, the different teachings of the church at different levels as we learn. I mean, that's what we need to do, not just how to put doilies or, um, you know, uh, or the things we used to do in the 60s, the, the, the um, Velcro things that would make pictures, you know, I mean, it's... Oh, the little collages. Yeah, collages and, yeah. and stuff. I mean, it's more than that. It's, but there's a bottom line that I wish I heard happen more often in our CCD programs, and I call it closing the sale. We've got to make sure, sure that we talk to our young, especially our teenagers, and challenge them to make a deep commitment to Jesus Christ. Because if we don't do that. We give them all the information, but we don't close the sale. Somebody else is gonna. Right. And we need to make sure that our, that to me what's uh, the sacrament of um, confirmation is supposed to do. Mm -hmm. We've got to make sure that that happens so that we, they truly are as formed uh, in line with the church as we can provide in all of our programs in the parish. Let's go with another email. This goes from Mary Vallow in Cleveland, Ohio. I really enjoyed your book. I was one wondering if you had any advice on guiding my daughters to wear dresses. Unfortunately, I only started wearing dresses all the time about six years ago, and at that time my oldest two daughters were four and six. My younger two daughters were being brought up wearing dresses, but the older ones are now 10 and 12. It is sometimes a struggle. Thank you and God bless. Now this is a part of your book, and I know it can be controversial, right? Oh, very controversial. <laughs> it's one of those no-win questions. Thanks, Mary. Um, you know, for me, it, you know, it's, it's your money that's going to buy clothing. I guess that's kind of what it boils down to. And so, for my opinion, you know, this is what we wear. This is who we are. This is who our family is. And you know, it, we've also lost a sense in our society of our family name, and our family name means something. And, you know, we are Hammonds, this is what we do. We are Catholics, this is what we do. Um, it, and I think until they know or are making decisions on their own or spending their own money, and even when they're spending their own money, I don't know very many parents that let their children w dress like Britney Spears if they don't want them to be dressing like Madonna or Britney Spears. Uh, so there, the lines do have to be crossed. But what I tried to get across in the book, and what I learned from Dr. Von Hildebrand in the privilege of her book, The Pri Privilege of Being a Woman, is femininity is a gift. And that the feminists have lied to us by saying that, you know, we can be more successful if we're just like men. Well, they're inherently saying or acknowledging the superiority of men. 
but at the same time saying, well, we're better than them. So I think it's just a matter of drawing the line and saying, you know what, this is just what we do and why. And that's what I tried to do with the book is give the reasons why, because we are feminine. Yeah, sometimes what irritates me so much about the whole fashion industry is, is that we, uh, the, the buying public are like lemmings sometimes. We just do whatever the designers put in front of us and it's there and we see it eventually, maybe not at first, People might resist certain fashions, but pretty soon they're there. And you see the young guys wearing their pants way down, you know, around their hips. You wonder, what, why are we doing this? Who are we imitating? You know, who have we bought, who's, whose values have we bought into? Rather than being the standards for society, we've surrendered to society. Absolutely. And really, you, you mentioned young men. You'll notice if you go to the store, the men are actually more clothed than the women. They've got the big baggy pants and the big baggy shirts and the women are in these tiny little midriff things that are so tight or have these horrible messages, juicy or you know, hot chick or whatever, written across. They're using their bosom as a billboard. Um, and it's, girls are dressing more scantily than the guys are. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if I should say this on TV, but I don't know. We'll, I was, we'll skip it then. I, <laughs> I mean, it's just one of those shocking things that you hate to see happen in parishes when it's, you know, uh, the, one of the readers for Mass was wearing a miniskirt. And of course, then when she came forward and bowed to the altar, it was an embarrassing moment in the, in the sanctuary. I couldn't believe that that happened. No, and my husband, we were talking about this earlier, because my husband has had to leave Mass because some family with their teenage daughter will plump into the row in front of us. Yeah. And yeah, we, we need to Scandalous. set standards for our young sure. women, and, and it needs to, needs to be us adults that do that. Let's uh, go with the next caller, Jean in, in Missouri, I think. Is that right, Jean? Yes. Okay, what's your question? Uh, my question is, does she have any other children than the, the little boy she spoke of? And the second one is, um, did this bring her a lot closer to Mary? Thank you, Jean. Good question. Uh, yeah, I try to protect the privacy of my family, but I, I do have four children. They're 12, 10, 8, and 6. Uh, boy, girl, boy, girl. And they are the absolute delight of my life. So I do have four on earth, six in heaven. Um, and God has chosen at this point in my life to pretty much say that I think he said that I'm done. I'm not quite sure. He can always surprise me. So, um, But yes, this all has brought me much closer to Mary. Uh, as Marcus put it so beautifully, the rosary and Mary have been my golden thread that have been so strong and so consistent and so stable throughout my life. And I understand Mary better now. And let me tell you one, one reason why. Um, growing up, I don't know why, I just never really had that much. Some people have a very strong devotion to Mary. I did to the rosary, but I didn't quite understand Mary until I became a mother myself. You know, so, Jean, that was a great question. But I found out that when a woman is pregnant, the DNA from her baby actually goes throughout her entire body. And even after the baby is born, the DNA of that child remains in the mother's body. So for each child that we have carried in our womb, we carry that child's DNA within our bodies. And it got me, all of a sudden one day, I thought, no wonder our Blessed Mother was immaculate. She had to be. How could God be in her body if there e was even a stain of original sin. How could our Lord's DNA have remained in her body if there was even a slightest sin or even if she had committed the slightest sin? So being a mother and coming back to the church, but specifically being mother, has bonded me so tightly and so intimately with our Blessed Mother. All right. Thank you, Colleen. We're going to take one final break. Back just a moment, some final thoughts for the journey home.
Welcome back. Before we go to the final uh, thought here, I did want to make sure that we cleared up any confusion about the Immaculate Conception. It has nothing to do with football. It has to do with, uh, we're talking about Mary's own conception in which God, in a very miraculous way, uh, provided the pure vessel for his son who will be born in her womb by immaculately conceiving her in the, uh, in the womb of uh, Anna and uh, Joachim, right? That was her parents. But I would encourage you to go to the catechism. We don't have time tonight to go through the whole detail, uh, but I want you to go to that. If you have any questions, go to the catechism and look it up, and it's finally and very clearly described there. All right, talk a bit in conclusion then how your return to the faith has strengthened your faith in Jesus Christ. You know, it's, it, it, again, for me growing up, I think it was just being Catholic, um, but I did, I did understand who Jesus was and how he did die for us. But I think coming back to the faith, especially because I, I bounced around, I had all those dates at all those different types of church, and I, I felt something missing. I now understand that Jesus loved us enough to die for us, but it was more than that. It wasn't like he came down, he died, he left. He came down, he spent 30 years in formation, three years in ministry, and then he chose to die. Then he rose, and he spent another 40 days teaching the apostles and teaching his disciples and forming a church. So not only did he just die, he left a church behind that would teach and govern, sanctify, and save all men, especially through the sacraments and also through the Holy Eucharist. And so he's not just, um, I don't have just a personal relationship with Jesus. I have an intimate relationship with him because I receive him in mass and his, his spirit is truly within me. So that has deepened my whole understanding of not just the redemption, but all that he left behind in, in this formation that he left behind to make sure that we got what we needed. When I think about the ways you described the, those four areas of your life that were then changed, that's a way of, of understanding his lordship as he grew to become lord of your life in these different areas. You know, there's some areas we want to kind of protect for ourselves and hold back. Sometimes it's a very lucrative career, or it's your, your rights as a husband or wife, or you know, your understanding of what it means to be father, or in, in your case, understanding of what it means to be a woman. Mm -hmm. And uh, yet your surrendering to Christ affected you in those ways, still doing so, right? I mean, we're still on. Still on a growth process, on the growth still growing, still there. yeah. Well, thank you very much, Colleen, thank for you, joining Marcus. us. Thank you for sharing your journey with us and our prayers are with you and your continued speaking. Uh, ministry in which you have an opportunity to share some of these things you've talked with us on the program. When I hear a story like hers, I'm reminded of that verse in Scripture in first, Second Corinthians that says we are comforted by God in our own needs so that we can comfort others. And God and gifted Colleen in many ways, gave her, gave her many opportunities, but in her conversion equipped her to have a message for others. Every one of us has the same way in which God has touched us. Look for ways God can use you to reach out to others. God bless. See you again next week.